Welcome to Business Brains in the Bottom Line podcast. My name is Paul Delegro, your host. My guest today is Jeffrey Brewster from Objective. How are you doing today, Jeffrey? Doing better than I deserve. Uh, that's well, that's a good start, right? So, Jeffrey, you, you work for a company, you're in investment banking and valuation, and you are actually on the valuation side. Yes. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So, that's something really I, what I want to talk about today is the evaluation part of it. You know, there's, there's a lot of reasons why companies go out getting valuation, buying, selling. Oh, talk a little bit about that because that I think there's probably a million people out there that have a business that always wonder, what's my company worth? Right. right? Yeah. And that's a that's a sometimes that's a 3 a.m. or a 2 a.m. question yeah. that they wake up going, gosh, after all this work and I've been putting in 18 hours a day for how many years and missing this and missing that and sacrificing here. What is this all worth? Yeah. And sometimes that's the genesis of, I think I'd like to figure out just what somebody else would pay for my business. So do you see that a lot that just people just want to know, or is usually an event happen like a partner wants to get out or what do you think is the main reason why people look for evaluations? Yeah. So that's a great question and it's different for everybody because okay. now when people start thinking about that valuation of their business, there's usually a follow-on question and it might have something to do with a transaction potentially. So that could happen. It could also be coming a, an issue where they're thinking about their taxation and their estate tax planning. Uh, it could also be, well, I want to attract talent. So how do I attract talent with this valuation that I have in this business? Perhaps it's an incentive compensation plan. Perhaps it's an, uh, you know, is it something is what we call an, an, a ghost or a phantom equity program. Or maybe I give them real ownership in the company. So this conversation that you're having with yourself at 2 o'clock in the morning as a business owner can go in a number of different oh, directions. Sure, yeah. So, yeah, a lot of times it starts with that. Now, there are times where we call them definite events where you really do need evaluation. And that is the passing of someone. Right. That's a big one, I would think. That right? is, right. And, and another uh, business, business divorce where maybe a partner is saying, I want out. Yeah. And she's sitting there going, okay, and I want to get paid a lot to get yeah. out. And now you have to really decide what that's worth. Another event can be a marital dissolution uh, where two spouses are now looking at their main asset. And that's an event in which you now have to take and the court will direct as to how that is going to be divvied up between the two spouses. Uh, so there's other reasons to have valuations. And, and that's why we will sit down immediately and ask a question, what's the purpose of the valuation? Right. Yeah. So when, when, you know, once you find out the purpose, how do you, what are some of the basic things you do to evaluate a company to find its valuation? You know, and there's some obvious ones, right? Like, you know, assets and liabilities and all that stuff, but there's got to be a million other things that you look at, correct? There really are. And the one thing that those all funnel into, Paul, and I'll tell you right now, they funnel into cash flow. What is the cash flow of this business? Yeah. Because there are times where a company is really based on what that what we call the net asset valuation is. Yep. But a vast majority of the valuations that we do today are really based on what kind of cash flow can be generated by the business operations and essentially the resulting value that comes from the cash flow of those businesses. So is there, so is there like a formula that kind of standard formula that all folks in your business use, or is it kind of arbitrary? Like what what are the standards? I guess that's not kind of what I'm getting at. Yes, there are standards, yeah. and and I and I love to tell people that it is definitely a mix of an art and a science. Right. There's plenty of science. There's plenty of mathematics, but there's also that what I would call an overlay of intellect. Because you need to look at these numbers and go, what is the picture? What's the story that the numbers are telling me? Because sometimes just flat, raw data can lead you in a direction that may not be exactly correct. So when people ask, well, give me the formula for the valuation, so many people are saying in a different way, well, my buddy sold their company for X multiple of yeah. EBITDA. What's my yeah, EBITDA that, that's multiple? That's the big term is multiples, right? Yes. I hear that thrown around a lot. Right. You know. Yeah, that's what that's the cocktail. 
The, yeah. You know, that's the cocktail discussion. Like, what did you get for your company? Well, like in our industry, you know, that we, we represent a lot. We're a reseller, but we represent a lot of manufacturers. And I've noticed that a lot of the manufacturers are starting to become software companies and diso- uh, distancing themselves from the hardware. They say, hey, we're a software company because I guess the multiples, speaking of the multiples, yes. you know, I heard termed like software companies, their multiples are 10x versus hardware companies are like 3x. So they're obviously they're trying to get away from that 3x and get to the 10x, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to take it even one step further, if you can annuitize your business, now it's not transactional. Now it's I get to look at 20, 30, 40% of my revenue next year coming in. And here I am sitting in 2022, and maybe I can count on a certain percentage of my revenue in 2023. Great. Now I become an annuitizer. Yeah, business. that's what a lot of the uh, software companies in our business is going to subscription models yes. for that reason, right? You just, yes. it's, you know, if January 1 comes, you know how, how much, before you even do anything, how much business is coming in. Right. It's a good strategy, actually. It, it, I have, I, my opinion of that, I think it helps the customer in the short term, but hurts them in the long term because they're paying more. In the end, they're paying more because it's an annual fee. But everyone's doing it, so you can't really argue with it. Right. Yeah. There, the subscription model has even somewhat made it into the valuation industry. We were just having that conversation this morning, and and it's it was it's a bit uh, astonishing that 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 is actually what's happening in some cases. So how how has it worked its way into the valuation business? In what way? Um, so basically, what they do is they'll again we would do some market research on this to do a little bit more looking, but. Companies that know they're going to be doing multiple valuations, they may pay a firm a, an annual fee. I got it. Okay. And say, we're going to do X number and it's going to be this number, but we're not going to be too complex. And the complexity of valuations can can really spiral out of control quite quickly. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, you know, when you look at a company and... I guarantee that the, this must happen all the time. You look at a company and the the owner or the the, the folks, the board have, has an unrealistic expectation of what the company's worth, right? Everyone right. thinks their shiny little toy is better than everyone else's. So, how do you do? How do you handle situations like that where there's a disparity, a huge disparity? Very gingerly <laughs> and tactfully. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Because you're exactly right. This is something that if you can imagine, someone has put and sacrificed tremendous amounts of personal capital, perhaps uh, reputational goodwill. They could have been doing something else far easier. But what they chose to do is instead build this business. Right. And everybody has a different reason. There's a lot of similar ones out there and different combinations. But that's the one thing that's been so interesting in working in the valuation industry is I tell people I've got the best job wherever I've gone. I single-handedly have the best job. I've worked at some great firms before, but I still have the best job as a valuation person because I get to work with successful people, yeah, that nice? usually in successful companies. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Yeah, it is nice. You know, our industry too, we get to deal with a lot of different companies. You know, we're not like building widgets, but we're, we're solving problems for a lot of companies. It is nice to kind of learn about how other businesses operate and you see some, you know, you have a couple of duds in there, but for the most part, all our customers are doing very well. So it's kind of nice. But to answer your question directly, that is that we will basically try to close that gap, if you will, quantitatively, yeah, but in a very constructive and very cordial way. Because if you can diffuse a a, diff, a difficult situation with data, yeah. that's a that's a great way to start. Uh, and now that doesn't mean that that anyone's wrong. Right. It, it doesn't mean that that number that's uh, extremely high c- in comparison to maybe what the market bears, that there could be a reason for that. There are unique situations where we've gone in and looked at a client and said, well, that valuation is you know, out of line. But then when you dig in deeper and, and really the details tell you and drive you into that explanation or that aha epiphany moment. Yeah. And you go, okay, now 
interestingly enough, our numbers may be really far apart to begin with, but they're trending towards each other now. Got it. Now, that makes sense because, like I said, as long as you quantify it, right? Right. you're not doing this. You're not putting your thumb up to the oh. ear and just kind of saying, I think it's worth it. And I think the customers were, you know, your, your customers would respect you for that. Right. Just say, hey, I've got data to back it up. This is what we see other companies in your industry that these numbers are similar. This is what it's worth. The valuation industry has changed so much in just the time I've been part of it. I, I My wife and I were talking about this the other day. And she said, I remember when you were doing your undergrad and you would walk by these books in the library and it was value line data source. And she'd say, you would look at those and go, that's what I want to do someday. It's exactly like that. Well, what I'm telling you is that most of the data that you needed as a valuation person was in the library, in the dusty part of the library yeah. where nobody ever went. And, <laughs> you know, if you were there, somebody knew you were there for a purpose and yeah. a reason. You didn't accidentally go to that part of the library. Yeah. So that has changed. And, and obviously one would think, well, yeah, we're all online now. But it's changed even more than that because – from those days, and I won't even tell you what years those were, if you're wondering, if you're trying to do the math in your head there. <laughs> um, but since that time, the amount of data that has come into fruition and been really made available to valuation analysts is astonishing. Uh, we really didn't understand what a discount for lack of marketability was or what a discount for lack of control was. We kind of put our, like you said, thumb in the air and said, Oh, one's 25, the other one's 30. Yeah. Moving on. Um, and I'm and I'm getting to the point of where he said, you know, a rule of thumb for valuation. There literally was a book that was in print and it said the rule of thumb valuation book. Oh, that's funny. And and literally it was thick and you, you could get yearly edition. I think it's still in print. Uh, and, and I think people still look at that today as a somewhat guide Without doing the work to yeah. determine what the value is. Now, is that correct? Clearly not. Yeah. But it sometimes is what people need. Yeah. I, I it, you, you touch on a point. I would think in today's world with so much data available to us at our fingertips that it, it's got to be a data-driven business, I would think. It, it, truly. For the is. most part, right? It truly is. If, if you ever were to see a valuation and it didn't have a substantial amount of quantitative backing – you, you would automatically wonder what we call in our industry, the QC, the quality yeah. control. How did this make it through? Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, I, and this is kind of a, a vague question, but when you do an evaluation of a company, I know it's, it's on size. How long can evaluations take? Great question. And it, a lot of it is driven by the fact that the client has to provide a tremendous amount of financial information to us. Right. I say tremendous amount because I want to be Again, I want to be cognizant of the fact that this is not what they're doing during their day every yeah. day. This is not how they get paid. Yeah, it's not their day job. It's not their day job. Yeah. So when we ask them for five years worth of income statements and balance sheets and cash flow statements and capital expenditures, they either go, yeah, no problem. We press a button. Or do you understand what you're asking for, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah. And so I really am trying to be gracious about the fact that that you know it's going to take some time yeah and i don't think the bigger companies would have that at their fingertips Correct. right that large accounting departments and but the smaller companies that maybe outsource some of that stuff exactly a little bit exactly. tougher i have and we are working on a case right now where they literally need to go back to the paper files to get five oh, years wow. worth of accounting oh, oh, oh boy <laughs> that doesn't sound like fun to me oh it's you know it's it just adds to the uh plethora of experience yeah so you know when you do evaluation you do them both for buyers and sellers correct correct what do you prefer what's more fun for you i don't know that i have a preference uh because i get to know my clients so well and and it's i like to become part of it I love to have this situation where we are providing more value to them than what they're paying in fees. So right. it, it really is becoming a part of, of them. Yeah. Now, I will tell you that when we get into litigation support and we get hired as an expert witness, you have to really separate yourself yeah. from that. And you, you have to be kind of a trier of fact and a finder of truth. Uh, you got me thinking now of, 
if you have to go to court as an expert witness and you're friends with the people that you're either testifying against or for, got to tell the truth, right? Yes. I mean, you can't, you can't get yourself in trouble, right? Yes. They will find out. Yeah. I mean, we have a, a tremendous amount of people in the, in the legal field and experts at their disposal that will work through the very minutia that will expose anything that you're trying to quote unquote hide or shade yeah. or present in a certain manner that benefits your side. Yeah. You don't want to be in the news, right? Correct. Exactly. You want to stay off the news. That's my, that's one of my, unless it's, unless it's positive, like, you know, doing something great. But, uh, so I would think you've been doing this a long time and I, you know, I have friends like in the mortgage industry and they've got so many funny stories of over the years, things people try to do and get away with. And, I got to believe you're no different. You've got to have some funny stories that you can share with us. Now we will keep the names and uh, of the people out of this, but any 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 fun stories you can share with us? Yes, we'll protect the innocent at all yeah. costs here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so there's some that again they're they're funny at the times they become, you know, very stressful. Uh, yeah. We call them the hockey stick projections. Okay. So, uh, having grown up in the, you know, in Northern Illinois, you know what the hockey stick looks like mm -hmm. when it's laying in the ground and it's, it's got that, uh, that almost near right angle up down, yep. down the line a little bit. Well, projections of growth and revenue and growth and earnings tend to be like that on occasion for some companies. And so you'll look at that and you'll start digging in a little deeper. I mean, we were talking about the details. Yeah. And start asking questions about, okay, how are we going to get to this point? And if we grow at this rate for this period of time, do you realize that you'll become the market? Yeah. Not just be part of the yeah. market. You'll actually be the market. How does that work? And then all of a sudden you'll see some some eye shifts and looking over at different people like, okay, so, okay how are we going to do this? Um, others that we've seen is again, where you say, okay, you're going to take the same five people here and you're going to grow this company 500% with these same five people. Yeah. And you're not adding anybody else. How are we doing that? Yeah. I, it's one thing to be optimistic and it's another thing to be unrealistic as well. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, some of the other, some of the other stories that we get, uh, you know, I, they're, they're a little more insidious. Um, yeah. We like those better by the way. <laughs> those sell more, to be honest with you. We like yeah. the, we like the nasty ones. So I call this calendar flipping. So explain what that, what is calendar flipping? Well, we, we, when the old days when we had a calendar, right, we had to flip the, we had to literally flip it. There was a ring on the binder or you tore it off and, you know, you flipped it just like a piece of paper, right? Well, we'll call it calendar flipping because something happened and we're going to value this company as of December 31st. Four days later, something happens in January 4th, but we don't have to take that in consideration, right? Because we're looking at the valuation as of December, December 31st. 31st right. Well, we have had situations where the calendar got flipped and all of a sudden the Value on 1231 was significantly higher than a few days later because somebody else came in and did something, did something a few days later. Well, what are some of the things they could do to change that overnight like that? <laughs> Let's just put it this way. There was no support. Yeah. And and as valuation people, we were being misled. Got it. Uh, just by the simple fact of uh, we weren't being we were not telling you everything. Yeah. So sometimes that valuation professional has to get in there and ask the right questions at the right time. Right. I'll tell you a story, uh, and I'll set it up for you because it's, it's again, if you can imagine, uh, for our northern viewers, this is still going on today. For our southern viewers, we're thinking about the spring this time of the year. But on February 14th of a certain year, we literally drove over to South Bend, Indiana from Chicago in a snowstorm. And that, as many people would know, is a snow belt. So if you can imagine eight, nine, ten inches of snow flying all over the place, we were going there specifically to interview one spouse about their boat marina that was 
off of Lake Michigan. So we're in South Bend, Indiana. We show up. Even the attorneys didn't think we were going to make it through the snowstorm. So we show yeah, up. But you made it. But we made it, right? So we're sitting there in the middle of a blizzard, because this has turned into a blizzard by now. We're sitting in there talking about a marina. I mean, what is the most opposite thing you can be thinking of in a blizzard? Is going out on the boat on yeah. Lake Michigan in, in your swimsuit. Yeah, exactly. And not, not, not just, again, it's, it seems like a million miles away. And so we're having this conversation. And we asked specifically if this marina had any expansion plans. And the answer came back unequivocally, no. Like, okay, great. So now we're leaving. That was one of the many, you know, somewhat terse and tense situations where we're asking these questions. And in a litigation support case, this can happen. Right. So as we're getting these responses back. We're obviously coming up with the, the conclusion that this is probably a business as usual, um, you know, typical marina, going to give you fuel, gas, food, you know, beer for the boat, you know, fun things like that, that you would typically need for a, a day on the lake in Lake Michigan. We go over and we literally visit this marina on the way back to Chicago. So now by now you're talking about 12 inches of snow. <laughs> blowing everywhere five o'clock in the afternoon and five o'clock in the afternoon in this part of the country in february it's black yeah, it is say, dark it's, it's you nighttime. can't see a thing the only thing you can see is what's so we drive through i look at my business partner and i go yep this is exactly what i would expect to see at a boat marina on lake michigan on february 14th shall we go now yeah we go back and this is where the social media communication socialization of our society works its magic because we're sitting down about a week later and come to find out somebody starts telling us about these grand expansion plans of hotels and casinos in this area of Michigan. My boat, my partner and I both look at each other and we go, that's next to our boat marina. Yeah, so it's going to have a huge impact. Massive impact. Yeah. So we get back on the phone and we talk with the other side's counsel. And we said, we find out that this is going on. And we know that this is going on. And we know that you're part of these plans. The marina is X, but these are happening adjacent to it. Legal counsel calls back and says, we're ready to settle. <laughs> so even when you're trying to be... Again, yep. So much sly with the with the facts, it tends to find its way back. Yeah, I guess they didn't lie, but they omitted. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Well put. That, that must go on a lot, though. It I does. Would, I mean, just because you're gonna, everyone's trying to position their company or their situation in the best possible light, right, to maximize revenue. Right. Right. Like the like you, when you walk in and you look at the financials and you see that the that the CEO hasn't taken you know, any more than a thousand dollar salary every month for the last four years. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. To show that the income statement and the cash yeah. flow generation is this much better. Well, you know, a good valuation professional is going to go, uh, that we have to normalize that. Right. We have to come back and go, what would you pay a CEO? What would you pay a CFO? Correct. Um, another one that we just had recently was a management company. All of the expenses that were overhead and administrative were being essentially paid for by the management company. I'm like, okay, so all of these services that are being provided, what would a buyer need to do in order Correct. to, to yeah. do that? And so that normalization now comes to a better point and a better valuation. It's more defensible when a seller goes to market or goes to negotiate with a potential buyer. Yeah. So I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What happens if you go through the process, the company's sold, and then you find out things after the fact that were omitted, not lied about, but omitted, like that boat marina situation? What happened? What can, what recourse does the, the 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 buyer, the new buyer, or the seller, excuse me, whichever direction it goes, have? Yeah, it gets complex and it gets complicated because essentially what we're as valuation professionals held to is 
the information that's provided to us that we that we knew and there's a common term out there known or should have known as of that date and that should have known known or knowable right a lot of people like to put the should have known on there because we should have known open up the door yeah because it can be a number of things now you need to go back and say by by the way that the questions were asked in the way that the questions were answered this is what we were able to deduce. Now, if you provide us with false information or you omit information, we are really only held to the standard of what was provided. What yeah. could we work from from that date forward? Yeah. Now, I, I would think if you if you do your due diligence and with the information provided, you'd be in okay shape. But I bet the other side may not think that. That's right. And, and, you know? and, and understandably so. Yeah. Uh, if I were, I'm going to put myself in their shoes. You know, they hopefully would have found something out during their due diligence process. And that becomes something that we work with quite quite closely uh, from the transaction services groups yep. who will go in and, you know, literally, that's another uh, area that you talk about finding skeletons in the closet and some of those insidious stories that yep. result in a whole lot more. Uh, detail than maybe you even wanted to know going in. Yeah, uh, the transaction services folks really do have you know the position that they need to determine and find any of those quote unquote skeletons in the closet. Yeah. So what's the climate like out there as far as n- you know number of businesses being bought and sold and you know because obviously evaluate and not that all you do is for buying and selling but I would think that there's a majority of it is for that. What's the climate like out there? What are you seeing? Yeah, so it's very, very robust. Uh, transactions, um, again, I'll go back to my my colleagues on the transaction services side. Uh, as early as September of 2021, they were telling clients they were not de- taking on any additional work because the workload that they had in September of 2021 was going to take them all the way through, if not past, 1231 2021. That's interesting because you would think with this pandemic, right? I mean, some of the obvious ones, restaurants, where people are stuck at home, you've heard of so many restaurants going out of business, but it's nice to hear that there's uh, buying and selling was robust during that time, anyway. Yeah. You have a great confluence here. Yeah. Low interest rates. Uh, you've got great economic demand in certain areas, like you said. I mean, if you're if you're in a restaurant area, um, there was there was a lot of hardship in that area, yep. no doubt. Um, retail, uh, if you didn't have a great online presence, uh, the, the I'm just going to call it the mom and pop shops that that were yep. were wholeheartedly you know shut down. Um, it was really a difficult period of time, but for that, and I would say a majority of the industries that we're familiar with did well. Yeah. It's funny. We have a customer that's in the wholesale uh, distribution business of sporting goods, a lot of outdoor fishing poles and guns. And their business was doing very, very well. Because think about it. People are sitting home. Okay, guys, let's go out. Let's go fishing. Let's go right. play sports. Let's do something, right? Yeah, absolutely. That was, you know, you think about fishing. What do you, th- you think about being in crowds? No. You think about right. the open water, yeah. uh, you know, either casting through, uh, you know, using a, a fly rod or, you know, on your boat and there's nobody around, pristine yep. water. Well, that's all, the ultimate social distancing. Yeah. I think the boat business is taking a hit now, though. I think there were a lot of boats sold at the beginning, but now there's a lot of people trying to sell them. Well, I will tell you as a boat owner. Okay. I am uh, very much hit by the supply chain issue. Uh, In what way? I have a boat motor sitting at home right now trying to find parts for this. Oh, God. And it's a 2004. It's one of those purchases. If I can get personal for a Yeah, minute, absolutely. You can always get personal. It's it's one of these purchases that I made going, I will hand this off to my son the day that they're driving my body away in the funeral. Okay. Uh, you know, parade or whatever Hope they're going to call it's in many me. years. <laughs> and so <clears throat> literally have this boat. It's a fantastic make. 
can I plug the make? It's sure, you can. Yeah, yeah, Ranger boats. Made, All right. made it. They used to be made in Flippin, Arkansas. All right. Um, and fantastic boat, and it was just one of those wonderful purchases that had provided so many years of entertainment to my family, and literally maintained it, did exactly, and just li- quite frankly have parts that need to be replaced after a number of years. Yeah. Well, two things happened. Bombardier out of Canada decided that they were going to stop making this motor. Oh, God. And then do you think the supply chain issue was a little bit of a problem? Massive. Yeah, not going to matter. You know, try finding a fuel pump for a 2004 Evan Rude. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not like it's a Chevy, you know, Chevy truck with his millions of them out there, right? Right. And right. even at that, I mean, yeah. I talked to mechanics in the industry and they're having a hard time finding the parts that they need to repair. Even somewhat late model. Really? Yes. I mean, as, and especially when you go back uh, even five years, six years, some of those parts are, are becoming nearly impossible to find. Wow. So it it definitely has it, you know, again, kind of getting back to where the valuations on companies are at. The the, the supply chain issue is, is, a real, is a real drag. It can be a real drag, I think, on growth. It can be a real drag on profitability. Um, and... Uh, quite frankly, we're seeing it in inflation. Yeah. So up until this point in time, we had this perfect confluence of great, great growth, low interest rates, really excellent demand for certain levels of services and products, and that just boosted the the, the volume of the transactions that were being done in the what we call mid market space is really kind of that anything under a hundred million dollars in revenue. Very, very vibrant area. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what does that look like going forward? Time will only tell. Yeah. But yeah, we all know inflation is is real. And here, yeah. you know, as we sit here on, uh, you know, February of 2022, we, we all know inflation is real. Yeah. I mean, the numbers prove it, right? Correct. I mean, this the highest it's been in like 40 years, but hopefully it'll circle back around. I think we're past this pandemic, it looks like. And we can get back to normal and supply chains can get moving again and, uh, you know, interest rates will stay low. So we can hope. We can hope. You know, I, I, I have no control of it. I just, you know, I don't make the rules. I just kind of live by them, you know. That's right. That's so right. <clears throat> so uh, any any other, uh, anything else you'd like to say? Though I, I know I had one more question for you. So if someone is interested in finding out what their company's worth, what's their first step? What do they do? I mean- yeah, give us a call. Certainly, yeah. we can we can do that, and we can t- and we'll talk and walk through. And, and And again, one of the things that I love about working at Objective is that we're going to be very consultative and advisory. Because if really it was a 3 a.m., gosh, I wonder what my company's worth, and that was really as far as it was going to go, we have a way of, of helping you there. Yeah. If it's I woke up at 3 a.m. because my partner wants to be bought out and I don't know how to value it to be fair to her. Yeah. Then, okay, we have a, we have a way to help you there too. Cool. So yeah, I'd say just to ask the, ask the question and, and give a call. Yeah. If someone want, wanted to get in touch with you, Jeffrey, how would they do that? Uh, again, we're on the website, you know, at our objective cp.com. Um, you can reach me at my email address, which is pretty, pretty simple. It's jeffrey.brewster at objective cp. Dot com, or you can give me a call. Uh, yeah, you can bring four six nine three nine four one four four eight, and that is where you can catch me. All right, great. Well, J- Jeffrey, I really enjoyed this because this is. I think this this topic is a, a lot of. You hear a lot of people talking about it, what things are worth, and you know you you're uh, you've shed some good light on it. So I really appreciate you having having on. Any final words of wisdom for the crowd, the the listeners or viewers out there before we go? Well, at the end of the day, it's like somebody told me. The true value is what somebody is willing to pay for it. Yeah. So that's another thing is intellectual property too. That's another kind of, if you're just selling widgets like everyone else, it's a little bit different. But if you have some IP that's really valuable, I'm sure that changes the game, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah we're doing one of those right now for a company out of Korea. Yeah. And, and it's it's fascinating. And that is, that what's, is, again, makes my job so much fun. Yeah. Um, tell you a quick story if I can get into it. Sure. So, um, we were doing a valuation. It was a very early stage biotech company. 
And they were telling me about this product that they were going to inject into joints to basically lubricate it for joints as they wear out and stuff. And I said, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do this valuation and I'm going to, you know, we do, we're going to do a great job for you anyhow, but I'm going to, I'm going to pay particularly close attention to this because being a former offensive lineman, I'm sure you're going to be a client of mine and I'm going to be a client of yours. That's right. (laughs) And sure enough, about four years ago, I'm sitting there and my doctor goes, Hey, have you ever heard of this product? And I looked at him, I said, I valued that. Yeah, they, was, that's funny. And he goes, you're kidding me. I'm like, no, it's great. Let's do this. So did you do it? I did. How did, how did it work? Fantastic. That's great. Yeah, I got I got the injection in the joint, and I haven't had to have one since. Wow, that's awesome. That's a, that's a nice win. You know, people talk about getting knee replacements and hip replacements. You know, if you can avoid that stuff for a long time, it's quality of life, right? Yes. And just to be able to get up out of bed and... Do normal things. Go to the gym, golf, clean house, whatever you want to do. You know, so right, exactly, and 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 literally. I mean, we're living longer. We're going to work longer. I, I I come from a family of people who worked in the until their eighties. Yeah, and you know, if they'll put up with me for that long, I'd gladly do that. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be retiring anytime soon. I don't know what to do with myself, to be honest with you. You know, so <laughs> but at any rate, well, Jeff Jeffrey, again, thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate it. And uh, that's going to be a wrap for Business Brains on the Bottom Line. Until next time, Paul Delego signing off. <laughs>